Part 1. You will hear Kevin Brown asking for information about renting an apartment through an agency. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 5. Now the test will begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, as you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully to the first part of the conversation and answer questions 1 to 5. Good afternoon. How can I help you? Hello. My name's Kevin Brown. I saw your advertisement in today's local paper, Apartments to Let in All Areas of the City. Yes, Mr Brown. Uh, we currently have several properties available. What part of the city were you thinking of? Well, city centre, ideally. OK. And what price range are you interested in? Um, I don't really know. What have you got? Well, uh, prices start at £400 a month, going up to £1,000 a month. OK. And what's the difference? What does the price depend on? Well, uh, the number of bedrooms mainly. Uh -huh. The cheaper apartments have one bedroom, while the most expensive have three or four bedrooms. OK. Two bedrooms would be nice. So I'll say two bedrooms up to 600 a month. Mm -hmm. Do you have anything like that? Right, sir. We have... Uh, just give me a moment, please. Mm -hmm. um, uh, we have two properties that might interest you. One is in North Street... It's, uh, well, it's, uh, it's a very nice apartment, uh, but it's £750 a month. Uh, but that includes a private parking space. Hmm, £750. That's a bit higher than I'd like to go, really. Do you have anything less expensive? Uh, yes. Uh, we have another one at £625 a month. £625? Mm -hmm. All right, that sounds interesting. Where is it? It's in Cornell Road, at number 12B. I don't know that. How do you spell it? It's C-O-R-N-E-L-L. -L. It's near the park. I've never heard of it, but I'm sure I'll be able to find it on a map. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 6 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 6 to 10. So, would you like to see the apartment, sir? Yes, I would. I'd like to rent somewhere fairly soon. Mm -hmm. Would tomorrow be possible? Uh, uh, sorry, I'm afraid nobody is available all day tomorrow. It's quite a busy time of year for us. I see. But if you're free later today, you could see it at 5.15. Sure, no problem. I could manage that. OK. So that'll be uh, 5.15 with my colleague Jason. Hmm. He'll meet you at the apartment. That's fine. And one more thing. What do I need to provide to rent an apartment with you? What documents, that kind of thing? Yes, of course. Um, do you have a job? Yes, I work in a travel agency. Well, uh, a reference letter from your employer, you know, saying you work for them, and a deposit, which is one month's rent plus a fee of £60. What's that for? It's an administration fee to cover the cost of preparing the contract. OK. And one last thing. When would this apartment be available? It's empty now, so you could move in as soon as the contract was signed. That's great. Thanks very much indeed. Bye. <laughs> Goodbye, Mr Brown. <laughs> that is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
Now turns to part two. Part two. You will hear part of an introductory talk about a library. Listen and answer questions eleven to fifteen. You will hear part of an introductory talk about a library. Listen and answer questions eleven to fifteen. Good morning. My name is Mandy, and I am going to tell you a little about the John R. Jones Memorial Library here at Blackwater College. We regard the library as a gateway to the resources that you, as students at the college, may need. The majority of you are full-time students. You may find you spend a lot of time here. Even those of you who are part-time students will no doubt require the services too. I hope that by the end of this short talk, you will know the services the library has to offer, including the website and how to get any further help you may need. Oh, sorry, I forgot. There may be a few distance learners on the tour today. I'll explain about the online facilities and borrowing by post scheme a little later on. This is the main site of the library, but we also have the Rivergate Building and the Fieldhouse Library. The Rivergate Building houses the geography resources, that is the book collection and the journal collection, as well as the map collection. The hours and days of opening of the Rivergate collection are the same as this building, except that it is closed on Christmas Day and New Year's Day. The Fieldhouse Library contains a specialist collection of local history, and if you want to visit it, you will need to make an appointment. Those two facilities are the only exceptions to the rule that all the Blackwater College libraries are open twenty-four hours a day, seven days a week, three hundred and sixty-five days a year. However, to gain access to the facilities, you must have your ID card. No ID card, no entry. We have heard all the stories and excuses, and we don't accept any of them. Just remember your ID card. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions sixteen to twenty. Now I must apologise for the mess you can see around you today. Libraries should be quiet no, places, but unfortunately, this is not currently the case here. This new building has been here for only two months, and as a result, we have not quite finished moving in. So far, we have moved most of the book and journal collections from the old library into this new building. There are two exceptions. We are currently moving the economics collection here, which should be installed by tomorrow, and we will be moving the French literature collection into this building next week. But as you can see, we are still building the new restaurant.、Uh, we will finish it, we hope, <laughs> very shortly. We have finished the cafe, however, and students can use it during the library opening hours. We have recently installed 150 computer places, and we will be adding another 100 shortly, so that there will be plenty for everybody very soon. Very shortly, this library will be one of the finest in this part of the country. Don't forget that the library isn't just about academic books. In addition to the books and journals, there is a wide range of national newspapers available from the librarians on request. I'd like to mention the different ways you can get help in using our resources. Don't forget our website at www. 
mlbc.ac.uk. There are the full catalogues and journal access is available if you have your password and ID number. Now, any questions? That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. You are going to hear a conversation on rivers. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Now listen to the tape and answer the questions. Please tell me about the current state of the Amazon. We have increased deforestation, increased human population relating to deforestation, and a role of fire in the Amazon on a scale that's never been seen in history. At the same time, you can see progress in trying to counter that negative trend. How do you see this? We see this in the creation of national parks and indigenous areas, and efforts to fund sustainable development activities for locals. We see both good and the bad, and it's going to be a race to finish. I understand that you started the Minimum Critical Size of Ecosystems project. Could you tell me about it? A number of years ago, it became apparent that those practising conservationists didn't have the scientific information available to properly design a conservation area. They didn't know how big it had to be, right? People were learning that as forests fragment, the fragments begin to shed species after they become isolated, so they end up becoming poor examples of what they had been. This relates to the size of the fragment. Do people still study this? Yes, there is a rich subfield of conservation biology that looks at the efforts of fragmentation. One of the consequences is a general policy response to set up protected areas that are fairly large, something on the order of 1,000 square kilometres. Now look at questions 26 to 30. As the talk continues, answer questions 26 to 30. Can you talk a little bit more about the forest fragmentation? As habitats are destroyed, they are accompanied by habitat fragmentation. So when 50% of a forest is lost, the remaining 50% being is not one large block, but smaller pieces, which makes the conservation problem even worse than saying that 50% has been lost. And this affects not just forest, but species diversity, correct? In terms of species loss, we can't give you precise numbers about how many species are lost because of these fragmented landscapes. But we're beginning to get close to where we can make that estimation. And so one of the policy responses to all of this, beyond just trying to create large protected areas, is to try and reconnect the fragments. You've been active in many projects studying the Amazon region over the years. Can you tell us about that process of understanding the Amazon? When people first started looking at conservation priorities, there was not much information about the geography of plant and animal species. One of the first clues was an analysis done in 1969. This looked at bird species and found geographic clusters of species which occurred nowhere else and those are priority areas for conservation. Was this when people began prioritising refuges? 
Yes, it was the first time that someone looked base and wide at priorities, giving priority to so-called refugee in areas. Was this when the new trend to use geographic information systems, or a GIS, started? That was in 1990, after we worked out a whole set of biological and conservational priorities and produced a big map using GIS. What are some of the things that GIS does? Well, there are several advantages of using a geographic information system. First, you can continually update the system so that it's now a constantly changing picture. You can actually watch changes. Then you can include large amounts of data, including information about the vectors of development: roads, railroads, pipelines, hydroelectric projects, etc. And finally, because it is accessible on the internet, it makes this information available to anyone who's interested. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. First, you have some time to look at questions thirty-one to forty. Now listen carefully and answer questions thirty-one to forty. Today, in our series of lectures on nature history, we are going to be looking at amber. Do you know amber? What is it? How is it formed? What are the uses of amber? Firstly, what is amber? Amber is fossilized resin from ancient forests. Amber is not produced from tree sap, but rather from plant resin. This aromatic resin can drip from trees, trapping debris such as seeds, leaves, feathers, and insects. The resin becomes buried and fossilized through progressive natural changes. Therefore, amber is formed as a result of the fossilization of resin that takes millions of years. Although a specific time interval has not been established for this process. The majority of amber is found approximately thirty to ninety million years ago. You may ask why resin is produced. Although there are contrasting views as to why resin is produced, it is a plant's protection mechanism. The resin may be produced to protect the tree from disease and injury caused by insects and fungi. Resin may be produced to heal a wound, such as a broken branch. And resins have odors or tastes that both attract and repel insects. Resin may also be produced as a plant's method to dispose excess acetate. We know that amber survives millions of years, but what type of depositional environment preserved amber? One depositional environment for amber is marginal marine. Amber's specific gravity is slightly over one, and it floats in salt water. Therefore, amber becomes concentrated in marine deposits, moved some distance from the original site. Trees and resin may be transported and deposited in quiet water sediments. Wood and resin are buried under the sediment, and while the resin becomes amber, the wood becomes coal. Wet sediments of clay and sand preserve the resin well because they are devoid of oxygen. So, as a precious product of nature, what are the uses of amber? In ancient times, amber was used for medicine. Honey was mixed with powdered amber, 
and prescribed for many chronics like asthma, gout, and the Black Plague. It was also used as precious decoration. The amber jewelry was thought to have the magic power against evil and dark forces. Sailors burned amber on ships to drive away sea monsters and the dangers of the deep. Amber has retained its beauty for millions of years, but if not preserved well, it may lose its charm. The softness and brittleness is likely to be attacked by chemicals and requires some special care in handling and storing. So do not put your amber jewelry on before hairspray and perfume is applied, because it will likely create a whitish coating on the amber that may be permanent. If you want to string the amber beads on silk or linen thread, remember to string them with knots between each bead to prevent mutual rubbing and chipping. Amber jewelry should not be stored where it can rub against metal or other jewelry, and storage in a soft cloth is best. Never put amber jewelry in a steam cleaner, which would shatter the gem. Never let amber come in contact with soaps or commercial jewelry cleaning solutions, which can dull the finish. Keep amber away from common kitchen substances such as salad oil, butter, and excessive heat of ovens and burners. Dust and sweat can be removed with clean, cool water and a soft cloth. Never use hot water. The amber can be dried and rubbed with clear olive oil, then rubbed with a soft cloth to remove excess oil and restore the polish. The last thing I'd like to mention is the storing of amber. Amber should not be placed near heating ducts or in direct sunshine, and avoid exposure to sudden changes of temperature. Well, that's all for amber today. Hope you enjoy this precious product of nature and have the luck to own one. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.